you're building a SaaS business, achieving compliance with SOC 2, ISO 27001, or other in-demand frameworks can unlock major growth for your company and establish customer trust. However, this process is often time intensive and very costly. Vanta automates up to 90% compliance, getting you audit ready quickly and saving up to 85% of associated costs. And Vanta scales with your business with a market leading trust management platform to help you continually monitor compliance, unify risk management and streamline security reviews. Join 7,000 global companies like Atlassian and Dovetail that use Vanta to build trust and prove security in real time. My listeners get 10% off Vanta when they go to vanta.com slash fun. That's vanta.com slash fun. Hi, I'm Chris Titley and this is Fintech Fun, the podcast where I speak with Australian fintech founders and executive management and have some fun along the way gaining insights about the person behind the brand. Fintech Fun is part of Day One, the network dedicated to founders, operators and investors. So I'm joined by Danny Pazeski, COO and co-founder of Instantia. Danny, thanks so much for being part of this series. Hi, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Danny, let's talk about uh, Instantia, the uh, origins of the business, uh, obviously a very new business, but a little bit about yourself and how you came to that point to, to start this. Yeah, look, I, I oh, finished university back in 2007, wanted to get into finance, didn't know anything about finance or what I really wanted to get into. Um, but just after a few jobs, found myself in 2009 working for a company called Afex, which was a global payments and foreign exchange specialist. Um, absolutely loved it. Loved the foreign exchange markets, the you know the fast changing dynamic pace and you know markets moving around, and it was just just something that was really exciting for me back then and still is now. And worked there till 2021, where uh, we sold the company. So. Apex sold in 2021, and, and at that point, I, you know, new job after about 13 years in, in the same company, wanted to stay in the industry, mm. um, and just thought, let's sort of look to see if I could do this for myself. Excellent. And in regards to setting up your own business, uh, was it along the lines of that you saw a, a gap in the market or some sort of deficiencies in particular areas of the foreign exchange market, or was it the fact that you thought there was a a big enough pie to start with some complementary solutions. It's actually funny how it came about. At the start, it was, you know, let's just start a little consulting uh, firm and see how it goes and, and did that for a little bit. There's so many gaps in the market, right? And 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 most of it, and almost all of it is can be or will be solved by technology. Hmm. Um, but when I was first starting out, did not have the resources, did not have the, the capital. Um, and it wasn't something that was originally uh, a thought of mine to do um, until I was, you know, through my network introduced to a company called VNG, who is one of the, who, who is the first tech unicorn uh, company in Vietnam. Right. And yeah, through this introduction, um, I was able to then sort of really sit back and say, okay, where can we take this? Right. And some of the first things that we looked at were, you know, what were the gaps in the market in 20, around 2012, 2013 options uh, really hit the market here in Australia. So, you know, what we do is we help businesses manage the the FX volatility risk uh, to their business. And, and, a, and a very sort of simple product is a forward exchange contract that allows you to lock in today's rate to use later on. Um, then options became really popular because it started giving clients that security of, a, of, of downside, but then the potential to perform if the market moved in their favor. So that really took took off around 2012, 2013. Um, and that's where we did see a lot of growth. Mm. But what never eventuated with that was the technology to support, you know, the clients through that journey. They are very sort of complex and sophisticated products, and there's not much uh, transparency around it. Um, and over the years, as a manager, I saw a lot of clients get unstuck through this. So, yeah, sorry, long answer to your question. No, no, it's been great. I mean, the, the use cases are... are, are... I suppose far and wide in particular industries, but ones that come to mind for me is things like agriculture, uh, mining, a lot of uh, exports uh, from Australia, and also a lot of um, companies that do businesses with offshore groups. Um, uh, who is your target market and, and what are you looking to, to do in regards to getting your name out there? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you mentioned a couple of key industries, especially around the export side, the mining um, and agriculture. And from my experience, I mean, we, we deal with any industry that imports and exports, right? So 
you know, some of the biggest are the, the um, agricultural and mining industries. And one problem that they have, they have very tight margins because of the global competition that they come up against. So having very tight margins, every cent the Aussie dollar moves um, up or down could be in their favor or against them. So when they're securing their profits, um, you know, they need to then, they'll secure very, very small margins. But if they could get the upside, they're going to go for that. Um, and that's how sort of options became very prevalent within the, in, the industry. Um, but then what didn't come with that was that lack of technology. And Daddy, in regards to who you're targeting at those various organisations, I'd imagine there'd be uh, CEOs, sorry, CFOs and all the, the treasury groups, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. You know, we mainly deal with financial controllers, CFOs, um, and, and sometimes, you know, we'll then present to the board, um, who'll then make a group decision where the CFO will ultimately run with that uh, decision made. But uh, yeah, we work with, you know, from smaller end clients, which will be the business owners. Um, you know, our target market is really anything. We don't discriminate on size. You know, we, we've worked a lot with clients doing smaller volumes around two, three, four million dollars a year, who over time become your larger clients doing 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year in, in uh, you know, global imports or exports. And Daddy, the t- on the technology side of things, I mean, you mentioned that a couple of times in regards to the tech that's coming with it. How have you gone about building that tech and, and, uh, and, and so far the, the, the feedback that you've got? Yeah, uh, the thing about options is your, your clients are really relying on you to do the right thing by them. So as a dealer, you need to sit back and as you're getting clients into options, there's a lot of variables. So you have knockouts, knock-ins and leverage products. And the more you do this and the more you sort of go out over time is the higher risk you're adding to the client's portfolios. Um, so you really need to stay on top of this. And as you're managing, you know, 50 to 100 clients at once, it can get very hard for the dealer to do themselves. Clients get given position statements sent to them, um, you know, daily, which are very sort of complicated to read. They literally just say, you know, bought and sold calls and puts that doesn't give them much explanation. So even though you explain an option to a client, um, they understand it when you're sort of layering in over and over again over a whole portfolio it becomes very hard to grasp um so that has been the biggest issue within the industry is is sort of getting this out to clients and getting them to really understand it so there's been nothing around this apart from um a position statement or an excel spreadsheet that gets sent to clients so when we sort of came together to put in stancha um you know to create the company we really wanted to stand out and say what is going to be our point of difference we didn't want to just be another player in the market doing the same old thing and having that the technology company behind us that you know they gave us access to almost 60 developers full-time for two years oh wow yeah which which we had an initial plan which was to build um a visual of the client's products which we did um, as well as to move the, a, the spot rate or a spot ladder up and down to see how these how the portfolio would perform at a future point in time. So clients could then say, okay, if today's rate is you know Aussie US 66, what happens if it goes to 68 and how am I impacted? So being able to create this and then now taking it to market and putting it in front of clients, we've seen the reactions of clients has actually, to me, been the best part because they're seeing risks in their portfolio they didn't have where... You know, you pull the, the spot ladder down and say, if we went to 63 tomorrow, you have no protection. Or if you went up, yep. you're now leveraged at, at you know, a certain rate. So, yeah, having, having been the ability to create that for the clients has made a huge difference so far for us. And I think in those what-if scenarios, you, you'll be seeing um, groups have a lot more control over their finances and obviously um, prone to shock markets and shock effects, which can happen in, in currency. And, and uh, yeah, the Aussie dollar has been a reasonably volatile, as you mentioned uh, uh, recently. But, um, you know, when we saw uh, the unprecedented events of what happened in 2020 on financial markets, there, there can be quite huge swings which can materially damage or, or, or the other way around, enhance one's balance sheet. Um, how, how are you finding um, companies using the platform going, actually, if we did a put here and a call here, et cetera, this is the way that we will actually, you know, uh, resoundingly sleep better at night? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you know, 2020 was really interesting with uh, with everything that happened with COVID and the markets. Um, I think we we fell from off the top of my head 78 uh, Aussie US down to about 58. So you're talking 20 cents in a very short period of time. And a lot of clients that did have that cover were in good positions and they used it up. But then ultimately they're stuck now at lower rates at say 58 cents. And the Aussie was sort of creeping around that 58 and 60 mark. And where a lot of clients were caught out, they started hedging at lower rates, um, you know, just due to the uncertainty. Yes. So when when the market did recover, I mean, the one thing that 
you know, clients can do now to avoid that from happening is they could actually go onto the platform and play around with the spot rate and say, okay, if the market does go down tomorrow and does shoot, you know, below 60 again, how am I impacted? What are my positions? Mm. The one thing about options, you want to try to keep them low risk, medium risk at best. A lot of clients get enticed into going to these higher risk options that have uh, certain parameters like a knockout. So, so what happens with a knockout, if the market falls below through a rate, you're knocked out of your protection. Mm. Right, so there's no genuine hedge there. So what we saw back then during 2020 was a lot of clients were chasing this outperformance and chasing 80 at a, as a higher rate. So when the market fell below and went down to you know 58, 59, they were knocked out of all their positions. Yeah, right. And this is that visibility that they didn't have, where you know the platform we've created um, through our RMI will allow a client to literally drag the spot ladder down and say, if we were to go through the COVID crash again in 2020 and the market falls to 58, what is my genuine protection? Yep. How much is my business actually covered? And Daddy uh, recently launched the business. And if we repeat this podcast in 12 months time, where would you like to see the business? Uh, well, we, we are looking at um, overseas markets. So we recently were granted our MAS license um, in Singapore, which is exciting. Awesome. So we'll be launching in Singapore in September. And we've uh, applied for our license in the UK as well. So in 12 months, if I was speaking to you, we'd be a, a truly a global company set up with our offices here in Sydney, as well as Singapore and, and London. Awesome. Awesome, Danny. Now, mate, uh, part of the FinTech Fund series, I always try and uh, have a chat to founders about what they do in their in their spare time. Obviously, being a startup founder, it's very hard to kind of switch off. Uh, some people don't switch off. Some people do. It's up to, up to every individual and how they're going. But uh, from your point of view, I'd, I'd be keen to to understand uh, maybe something about you that others don't know about? Um, well, while, <laughs> while I started, um, we started in Stancher, I, I didn't have any kids. Uh, well, my wife was pregnant. Now I have three kids under two and a, two and a half, which... Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. It, uh, some people call that peak hour traffic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it has been very challenging. Um, so I don't think I've switched off for almost three years straight now, which is uh, which has been a challenge. But the one thing I have gotten into since then is golf. Yeah, right. It is a, a very interesting game and one that does challenge myself. And I'm able to switch off while I'm playing. It's a good four hours to myself. Yes. Sometimes five, sometimes six or seven if I get a few drinks in. But um, the nineteenth hole. Yeah. That's it. It's my favorite one, and it's probably the only sort of um, time I get to myself uh, once a week, and it's something that I do. Yeah, no, Danny, I'm curious about the golf thing. Um, what, uh, wh where do you think uh, you get challenged the most on the course? Is it is it the teeing off? Is it the the choice of clubs, or is it sort of the the angles and and what to do when you're putting? Yeah, it, it, it's everything because you think it's an easy game, and when you finish, you go, "Oh, why don't I do this and that?" And then <laughs> you actually do it, and it, and it's hard. And for me, the biggest challenge and what I love about golf is I'm playing myself, and I'm just trying to continually better myself every time. I'm not playing against anybody else. I know what my best score is and that's what I'm going after every game. And uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> if you could avoid it, avoid it. I'd rather, I'd rather three kids under two and a half is easier than golf. Well, I was going to say, once you finish the golf course, you're going back into what's pretty hard as well with the three kids or so, mate. Um, do, you get into your, do you get into your, do you get into your, your TV shows yet? Your kids' TV shows, or they're a bit young. Yeah, Miss Rachel's very popular. I'm not sure yeah. if you've heard that one. <laughs> I think, yeah, um, yeah, well, uh, Peppa Pig, Miss Rachel, it's uh, Wiggles, it's it's everything. So I've stopped watching. There was any... uh, Paw Patrol. There was Bluey. There was a whole lot of them back in the day, and I remember Bluey's obviously still very popular, based from Brisbane. Yeah. So as a Brisbane, I'm very proud of that that particular show. But Peppa Pig always. Uh, always delights our family as well. Definitely. I think the one thing is you, you stop watching your own shows and you start watching the kids' shows. <laughs> yeah, and you start uh, recognising the episodes as opposed to uh, which Sopranos episode you recognise. It's now which Peppa Pig episode. <laughs> you, yeah. you start singing along with the songs. That's when you know you're done. <laughs> That's it. Danny, thanks so much for having a, a, a chat today and about the uh, origins of the business behind the scenes and, and exactly why you started it, uh, the progress that you've achieved uh, thus far and also the future outlook into becoming a global company uh, a big milestone achieved there with accreditation in Singapore and looking forward to, to catching up. Thanks again for being part of the FinTech Fun episode. No worries, Chris. Thanks for having me. Listen to the Unfunded Podcast brought to you by the Day One Network and hosted by me, tech writer Joan Westenberg. We're sharing the no-holds-barred untold stories from entrepreneurs who have decided to build a business on their terms. 
I'll be interviewing successful founders and operators on the grit and ingenuity it takes to build and scale independent startups without the support of traditional venture capital funding. Subscribe to the Unfunded Podcast now, wherever you get your podcasts.